Today is the fourth day of the July-August 1986 retreat. In one of the first talks, trying to clarify our relationship with each other here and asking if it was possible for all of us to drop the image of teacher and student. So that there can be a relationship. When there are images, there cannot be a real, live, direct relationship, then it's just images talking to each other. So in asking if this was possible, the word equality was used, saying that can we meet on an equal level? Actually, as the word slipped out, I wondered if someone would take this up with me, and somebody did. Because equality is a, a very difficult word to be using. It is loaded emotionally for hundreds of years, human beings striving and fighting and killing each other to gain equality. And it has never happened. There is still the rich and the poor, the black and the white, the highly endowed, medi medium endowed and lowly endowed intellectually or talent-wise. There are innumerable various cultural backgrounds that we have in which we were raised, which make us superficially different from each other. We've talked about it. The raising and being conditioned in a cultural background we all share, but the, the content is different. Some of us are at the top of a hierarchy in industry or politics. Others are at the bottom. No matter what revolutions have raged, equality has not been achieved. And maybe it is a fact that there is inequality on that particular level that we have just been describing on those levels. A woman is not a man and a man is not a woman. Albeit most of what women are supposed to do or be like is culturally conditioned as well as what men are supposed to be like and do. And yet, no man has yet born a child. So there was not this kind of equality that was talked about. And I want to give a better description, leaving this word aside, of what I mean meeting on the same level. Meaning, first of all, while well, the image we talked about, second, that a person who comes to a meeting feel free to ask any question. that he or she 
would like to ask, not worrying whether this may hurt me. I'm open to any challenge that was said in the beginning to anything that is said that doesn't seem clear or outright false or opinionated. Please bring it up. Because during a talk, we can't write things down, but right after talk, there are little pads outside. Write down what you want to take up with and do it, even if it is difficult. Because there is, as people tell me, time and time again, in spite of the relationship in many cases having changed, people not being afraid of a teacher, yet so many people report sitting in that room, they are waiting to come in, all of a sudden the heart starts beating faster. There's an ancient conditioning at work. Recent or ancient, most likely ancient. So, if that heart starts beating, let it beat. What of it? It doesn't incapacitate us. One can ask a question even while the heart rate is up. Maybe the throat is somewhat constricted for whatever conditioning we've gone through. And very quickly this will abate. But this meeting on the same level will only take place when both of us, in looking at something, discussing or questioning something, will be free of our opinions, backgrounds, past histories, and look afresh. If that doesn't take place, then there is not the same level than we were then we're not together in this. If in fact it does take place, then the inquiry is not yours or mine, it's a mutual thing. I don't say this idealistically, I say it factually. And if something is seen, then it is not my seeing or your seeing, it's seeing. Seeing the truth of something. The seeing without the background being truth. Which is not connected or dependent on these two personalities sitting there, which are not equal, not the same. Personality wise, it's not two, diff two personalities that are completely alike nor two inheritance patterns that are completely alike. No two bodies are completely alike. So I'm not indulging in idealistic talk. but wondering if this can come to pass that two human beings can be free from what constrains us as opinions and past knowledge, present knowledge, and look here, now, what is there. Which doesn't mean one may not draw on a memory as an example. All examples, all language comes from memory. All examples that may be chosen are memory. Unless one just listens this instant, that's not memory. That's what's actually happening before it has been recorded as memory. But if a memory is drawn upon, then can we clearly be aware that this is memory? Not that a memory unconsciously or compulsively drives us to say one thing or the other. A remembered past experience, it may not be consciously remembered, but the past experience is compelling us to talk in a certain way. 
that's different, a different function of memory than the free drawing upon it and awareness that what is being looked at is a remembered scenario. In this connection with equality, the person asked, maybe I brought it up the first day, but I didn't go into it. Why, why doesn't ABC give talks? You give a talk. Now there are two questions here. Why do I give a talk when I don't call myself or see myself as a teacher? And why doesn't ABC give a talk? Why ABC doesn't give a talk would have to be settled with ABC. One would have to ask them individually. I can't tell why they don't give talks. Why do I give talks? I could just say this is my function here, but I will go further than that. I think it's about a little over 10 years ago, I was asked to give talks. At that time, that's why I gave talks, because I was asked by my teacher to do that. And at that time, what my teacher asked of me, that I did, whether I wanted to or not. Today, the reason that talks are given is that there is so much to talk about, to be talked about, to be looked at. to be questioned together and maybe to be seen, to, to be brought into awareness, into light, putting an end to deception if that is possible. That's why talks are given. And they are given because you're here. If you don't come here, there's no talk going to be given. <coughs> As long as people are interested in doing this, coming to a talk, listening to it, inquiring, wondering, beginning to question, there will be talks. If that doesn't happen, there will be no talks. I don't think I would go out starting hiring a hall and advertising a talk to be given. <coughs> probably climbing around in the mountains someplace. Or hiking. Climbing isn't quite what I do anymore these days. Hiking. I wonder whether this is getting clearer and clearer. It would be marvelous. And do bring up your, your doubts and, and, and hesitations about this. So every time it may get a bit clearer for myself too at least how to express it. It's only when somebody asks and I have to really look how to express this. And the expression may not be the most appropriate or poor. So that's why it's very welcome to, for people to question words and terms and way of, ways of putting it so that we can look at it and, and re, rephrase, let new words come. I hope it is clear from all that has been said that I'm not trying to establish with these talks or the contents of the talks any kind of authority which would be lethal to our relationship. What is said are not is not said to make authoritative assertions, which as one person warned me may, may become religious dogma.
but to question together. Something may be said like that we are fundamentally not different from each other, we are not separate from each other. But it's not said for, for us to enshrine or inspire ourselves by, but to question, to see whether one can see the truth of it or whether it is false. That is the beauty of this work, it is alive. Unless one deadens it by making principles out of what is being said and then just remembers the principles. We have enough of those already. And just exchanging one set for another set, what good is it? Another question which came up, I think we went into it, discussed it earlier, it came up again in a most serious manner, and we'll, we'll tackle it again. I think it's all of our question. Not one of us does not need to ask this time and time again. Why am I doing this work? Yeah, me personally, but why are we doing this work? It does come up, I think, for anybody who attends a retreat for seven days or maybe three, four days and just sitting a lot without the usual entertainment, distractions and the work, absorption or family absorption. Just sitting alone with one's thoughts and not in communication except every once in a while in a meeting. And the fantasy may be projecting what one could be doing at home or someplace else during this time. Or just the, the boredom of it, or the pain of it, physical or mental, to be in touch, to get in touch with the mess inside as it arises. The chaoticness of the brain at times firing, 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 thought train after thought train, pro and con. And then hearing in a talk, don't strive for a goal, don't seek a refuge, don't expect a result. Why am I doing this? Right at the beginning, the opening talk, it was asked, why are we here? Maybe everyone who is here has gone or is going through or enmeshed in considerable pain. confusion, conflict, and maybe one is acutely aware of the sorrow, confusion and conflict that rages throughout the world, and maybe one has a, a feeling for the inseparableness of one's own inner confusion, sorrow and conflict, and that of the world, that there may be a very intimate connection. One may feel the confinement 
the isolation of this tremendously strong feeling of self. Sep <coughs> separation from, from others, the isolation and the pain of that. The shell, being aware of the shell in which we live and wanting out. <coughs> and maybe having given up attachment to systems and ceremonies, rituals, beliefs, worships, as a way out, maybe having an insight or feeling that this is just another, maybe more beautiful shell, more precious, and yet a shell it is separating from other shells. And maybe a realization that breaking out of the shell can only happen if one is, if one understands how one builds it, how one excretes it and accretes it time and time again firmer and firmer, tighter and tighter. One has been hurt. We talked about this when we talked about growing up as little children. All of us having been hurt often enough to build this protective shell around ourselves so we may not get hurt again. And now living in a shell, aching from the isolation that a shell creates, a protective shell. And not even being protected. That is the, the paradox of living in shells. We, we produce them to, to protect ourselves, the individual shells and then the collective shells shell of a nation, of a tribe, of a religious organization, a religious tradition, an ancient shell that one puts one's trust into, or has been raised in, or hasn't even chosen it. And then finding out that the shells are at war with each other, they are shelling each other. No collective shells have ever peacefully existed side by side. It just hasn't been like that. It's a fact. I'm not inventing this. Times people get very angry with me for saying what I do say about, particularly about religious separation religious identity which separates. This is not invented. One, one only needs to look in what name people kill each other, battle each other, terrorize each other. And the name of God comes up only too frequently. Religion. I think just logically, intellectually, looking at this problem right now, it's quite clear that if all the shells were dissolving, if there were no shells, we didn't live in these enclosures, individual and collective, <coughs> we 
we wouldn't have that reason to battle each other. We may invent new ones. So why do we do this work? Inside the shell we can begin to dream about salvation or refuges or another lifetime that will bring us more freedom or we can get cable TV into the shell. <coughs> or satellite TV. But it's still within the shell. We can drug ourselves intoxicate ourselves and temporarily forget about the shell by absorption in work, relationship. But we always come back to it. There it is, the feeling of isolation and separation. How, how does it grow? Where does it come from? How is it created? How do we maintain it? That is observable, that is open to questioning and maybe open to insight, to understand, to profound, deep understanding, which does dissolve the shell. That understanding is not fantasy. There's nothing cabled in. There's not belief or worship. It's see what creates the shell, how we maintain it, how we cling to it, how we attach to it. Our individual and collective shells. We may curse them and want to get rid of them, but deep down we're attached to them. We are our shells identified with them. And if they were cracking, what would we be? We may be nothing without an identifiable and identifying shell. Including the shell of suffering itself. Suffering itself can be an identity, a shell. It sounds absurd, but one can look at it, one can question it. Not take my word for it, please. This is not what these talks are given for. It's to look at things together. And that not just for a moment here and then drop the whole thing. It gets too hot, too sticky, too threatening. Well, if one drops it, then life in this shell goes on. That's, that's a fact. And to the extent that one is temporarily very comfortable in it, one may not even want to question it anymore, or even begin to question it. But once the discomfort is there, the discontent, the deep-seated discontent, we were talking about it the other day in a meeting. Let that be like a, a pilot light on the stove that burns away. If we seek contentment because of the discontent and find the contentment, then we're happy in that little shell. And the questioning stops. But if there is contact, touch, with this burner, this pilot light of discontent, then the questioning goes on. There's no choice. Or it can be fear, pain, sorrow, not to 
condemn it or want to get rid of it, but let it burn, feel it, be in touch with it. Please don't interpret this as masochism. It has nothing to do with it. If we come to this question from, from a new approach, a new, yeah, approach, why do I do this work? I think if one observes sensitively how we affect each other all the time, when we live closely together, there's no doubt how we affect each other. One person's mood immediately affects the rest of the family. One person's angry outburst affects the family. And one person's loving care affects the family. And the family members so affected will affect the people that they get in touch with beyond the family. I don't think there's anything we do in relationship that doesn't affect everybody because we're all in touch with each other in one way or another. I always used to use the example of one tiny pebble dropped into a lake, a body of water, touches all the water, all the shoreline, and the air that's touching the water. So what is it that is not touched? We know how we all participate in certain fashions of thinking, how, th how thoughts inter-influence each other. We, people who grew up in a similar milieu have shared the same thoughts or they are rebellious against those thoughts, which is still the same thing. If one participates in in mass rallies, football, football, or a, a rock concert, or turning out to see the Pope or the Lama, or whoever, Bhagavan. There is a, a mass psychology at work, which personally I've experienced growing up in Germany, having to turn out to see Hitler, drive through the streets standing in his car. And even though I knew from home that something very bad was going on, I was shivers, shudders, when this highly crying out and the, the, the mass ecstasy broke out when it's part of it then. And the physical Symptoms of it, the shuddering and the ecstasy, are not different from a huge amount of people chanting. Maybe a small amount of people chanting and raising the roof with the chanting. Same physical symptoms and feelings, which we call religious ecstasy or devotion. Or no doubt, a lot of the people had this religious devotion to, to Hitler, just as people have the religious devotion to the Pope or the Lama or the Bhagavan. One woman, I wrote her, I read her 
biographical sketch she ended up as a matron in a, co in a concentration camp. Very notorious, cruel one. She said in her teens, all she wanted to do is give her life to a cause. There was this tremendous yearning to lose herself and turn herself over to a cause, and the cause was there. And to that she gave her life. No matter what the Führer asked of her, she did it. That's what religious or ideological or nationalistic leaders demand and get that one does what they, they ask you to do with joy. You wouldn't believe the songs we learned and sang in school. Sometimes I go over them. I don't believe what, what we sang. The joy with which we give our life to him, with which we die for Germany and so forth. And in singing, you know, the ecstasy, the group ecstasy. Just to do something together, not to feel so entombed in a shell. Then one enjoys the, the offerings of the big shell. So from looking at this, and please, if one is interested and concerned, you can look at this for yourself too. The examples are there. It's happening all over the world. When one just needs to turn on the news, it's all there. This swell, ground swell, rise of patriotism in this country. Very, very alarming thing to watch. And yet, so many people feel it's healthy, it's good, and finally we got our national pride again. That's what Germans felt after the Treaty of Versailles, in which they had been humiliated. Quite a similarity, humiliated during the First World War, here humiliated from the Vietnamese War, and then someone restoring the national pride through Olympic Games. There were these Olympic Games in Germany, I remember, 1939. And all the medals that Germany garnered, all the medals that the Americans garnered at the LA Olympics, and the anthems, and the flags, and the colors. There are differences. I'm not totally equating what is going on in these two countries. But it's the same stuff, the same root out of which it sprouts. And unless there's careful attention, one is not carried away. What is the outcome going to be? War again? Star Wars. Right now we're just engaging, engaging in tiny ones against tiny little countries. This is not what I was going to end up with. I was going to question whether in the face of the tremendous influence and effect that the action of one individual has on everyone, far and near, but particularly close, but also far. Because we are interrelated. These days with the communications and travel, there is no, no, no barriers anymore, except psychological ones. It, don't we have an incredible responsibility with every word we say, everything we do? 
We may not like to hear that. And I don't mean it in a moralistic way, I mean it factually. Whatever I do affects someone, and that one will affect someone else. So unless there's some clarity, at least at times, confused actions or hostile, antagonistic or separating actions will spread adversity, confusion and separation. Or contribute to that stream, whichever way you wish to put it. It's inevitable. So is that why we're doing this work? Because of the responsibility that each one of us has in our relationship with each other? Not to be good or to be, but to, to act out of clarity out of understanding. And if one understands something here in oneself, one understands what goes on in all human beings. That is the beauty of it. If I don't understand in myself, if I deny and depress, then I will immediately find fault and accuse someone else where I can see very clearly, or fairly clearly, not very <coughs> clearly, <coughs> what I am blind to here in myself, that I project onto someone else and fight it there. These are all well-investigated psychological mechanisms, well-proven. But that we can read about the proof and that it takes place, it's not enough. One has to see it happen as it happens. And maybe if it's seen early enough, it, it very quickly, the reaction very quickly abates. I think we talked about that in the beginning. If anger is seen as it wells up, it may dissipate and melt before it has exploded, with which I'm not saying control your anger. Seeing and understanding has nothing to do with control. Control has to be seen for what it is, what it does. Seeing meaning understanding it as it operates, as one becomes aware of it. And one does become aware of these things and not hidden for all eternity to a mind that wonders and wants to find out how it is functioning, how it is operating and affecting oneself and others without deception, to bring deception to light. which is difficult if one immediately has standards and images how one should be, then one again doesn't want to look. But if these images and standards are put aside, just as one washes the glasses if one wants to have a good view, then one can look. Then one doesn't immediately have to say, oh my God, I don't want to be like that. I, I really am a non-jealous person. I'm not jealous. I overcame that years ago. No assumptions about what one has dealt with and, and worked with and finished years ago or yesterday. It may pop up again. Just like going through the forest, there are new mushrooms every day. Of every color. <laughs> They're beautiful. Every size. Some of them are just little tiny orange dots, but there they are. 
fertile soil and rain. And there's a new image. Or a new, or an old emotion. And the person say, I'm so surprised to see that I'm still like that. Why the surprise? Because a, a, a new image was put in place. Now I'm no longer jealous or this or that. Why do that? It, it, it's just like putting blinders on. We do it automatically. Because we want to be somebody. Am I talking too long? Can you follow? Wanting to be somebody, something identifiable and clingable to. Is it all I am, images? That's all I know. What when there is no image, what am I? Is that a viable question to ask? Ready to face whatever scariness and fear comes up, taking the risk. of exploring this, being nobody, and not a new identity of being nobody. That's a nice thing to be for a change. That was a, a beautiful song the Beatles put together. A little nowhere man sitting in his nowhere land, doing nothing for nobody or so. It was a gorgeous thing to get excited over, and a beautiful melody. Being nobody means the brain not clamoring for or seeking scanning for a new identity, but staying with wondering, with not knowing, and ears, eyes, every pore of the skin wide open in total vulnerability. No shell, no protection. No taking refuge in anyone or anything. Is that possible? We will end here for today.